but I'm Jeanette Jasperson, I'm the coordinator of international education, and it's my pleasure to be the moderator today. So a special welcome to our guests from the Netherlands, where it is 9 p.m. So we just appreciate your time that you're giving us. You're staying at school late. We appreciate that. And a special welcome to all of you who have participated in JCCC's Dutch Exchange Program. I see so many of you on this call, and we appreciate that. And our colleague Susan didn't get to go last spring because of COVID, but she will be going one of these days. So, yep, something to look forward to. We are recording this session, so if you have any concerns about that, now is your time to do whatever it is you need to do. We were just talking about creative responses to this time of travel restrictions and closed borders. And so one of the International Education Office's responses is, we said, we cannot send you to the world right now. So we're gonna bring the world to JCCC. And one of the ways we're doing that is with this virtual series. We've already had several events in this series and the recordings of those events are posted on our series webpage which my colleague Brooke, I hope, is gonna type that address into the chat box. And so if you are interested, you can go listen to other recordings. And speaking of the chat box, our presenters today um, will leave some time for Q&A at the end. So if you have a question, please type it into the chat at any time. You don't have to wait until the end. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you today's speakers whom we've already heard a little bit from. And lucky for me, Remember that video that we saw that, uh, about the Netherlands that was sent out yesterday and how there's a sound in the Dutch language that we don't have in English? So our first presenter's name actually starts with that sound, so you can hear me try it out. Um, tell me how close I am. Gilles van der Koot is a teacher wow. and a coach. Is that okay? That's pretty close. Uh, oh, Dennis. good. <laughs> He's a teacher and a coach in the Department of International Business Studies at Koenig Willem I College. He has an extensive background in business, including 12 years with Hewlett Packard, and he's also co-owned several companies. He switched to the field of education in 2015, and his current focus is one that's dear to our hearts, which is on internationalizing his department and the college as a whole. And so in one example, he has some of his students currently working on a project focused on Rwanda. His colleague and co-presenter today is Tineke Larkhoven, something? That's Oops. okay. Uh -huh. Thank you, okay. She's a counselor and a teacher of many different subjects, including law and politics, career and citizenship, sustainability, global goals, and here's one I really love and we could teach more often, bridging intercultural and international differences. Tineke has taught at several different schools in the Netherlands at all different levels, um, including adult education and secondary. And currently um, she's at Koenig Willem I. Also with us today, we welcome Ms. Renee Frome, the head of the international office at Koenig Willem. And those of you who've been on the Dutch exchange, you'll be interested to know that that office does the matching for the exchange. Mm. So welcome our Dutch friends virtually to JCCC, and we're eager to hear about what's in the headlines in the Netherlands. Okay, thank you, Janet. Uh, and compliments for uh, your pronunciation. Uh, excellent job. Um, okay, I'll start uh, sharing my screen. Here you go. Okay, obviously, although uh, the Netherlands are a, uh, a very tiny country, uh, certainly for you Americans, at least I suppose most of you are American, uh, but still, to uh, introduce it in uh, only half an hour, uh, it's uh, pretty arbitrary, of course, what we uh, chose to, uh, to discuss. And now I find that I'm completely at the end of my presentation. Sorry about that. Okay, headline from the Netherlands. Um, let's start. Uh, Tineke, will you please? Yeah, um, the first uh, slide you see is um, a coat of arms of the Netherlands. Tineke, you have to speak up a little bit. Okay. Closer yeah. to the microphone. Okay, I'm sorry. 
Um, in the Code of Arms, you read a French uh, phrase, je maintiendrai, which means uh, I will uphold. And it was pronounced by um, one of the Williams, the predecessor of William IV, and his name was uh, William of Orange. And it meant it was pronounced in 1565, and it means uh, something like, I will uphold the highness of my name, the honor, faith, and the law of God, the king, my friends, and myself. So yeah. uh, this is still in our coat of, coat of arms. Yeah, and the lion comes back a lot. For instance, in the national yeah. uh, football team, soccer team, they also have a lion, and uh, so it's, uh, uh, you see it very often. And as you can see in the slide, well, it's not a very high quality, but you see we're on the, uh, the Netherlands border, the North Sea, and just uh, left you see the United Kingdom, and the uh, direct uh, neighbors are Belgium to the south and Germany to the east, and for the rest of the sea. Um, okay, and then to the uh, bottom right, that's uh, the country including or uh, with uh, indicated the 12 provinces. And uh, in the center south, you see one of the biggest uh, provinces, which is called North Brabant. And there's a red dot, if you can see it. That's the capital of the province, uh, Sertogenbosch. And that's where uh, René, Tineke and me uh, currently are. So it's in the south. And it's also important to note that there's culturally and in well some areas, uh, you could say there's a difference in mentality between roughly above the big rivers, because in the center of the country, uh, there's a few big rivers like uh, the Rhine, uh, the Meuse, I think, Baal, and then there's really a difference between the north and the south. The southerners being more laid back, uh, their accent is also um, softer. Okay, just some uh, background information. Okay. As an introduction, we decided to show you a few uh, very low quality uh, images of, uh, of the Netherlands. This will look uh, pretty familiar. Eh? Flowers, a uh, big uh, export product, the windmills, very typical. Uh, and we have, because we border the sea, we have quite a long coastline. And uh, uh, to the north, it's really very quiet there with islands and uh, you know, completely open to sea, wind, and only dunes, and it's uh, really beautiful up there. Uh, okay, also typical uh, winter. Although I must say in the Netherlands, due to climate change, I'm pretty sure of it, uh, we don't see winters like this anymore. You know, um, a little bit of snow, but uh, you know, the really typical traditional winters are mostly gone. And uh, well, Probably all of you have heard that uh, Holland is, uh, Netherlands, I should say, is uh, completely flat. Well, that's not entirely true. We do have a few hills, and our highest one is uh, 325 meters. And uh, this is the area where this uh, hill uh, is situated, and it's in the, in the south of the Netherlands. Uh, like, uh, really, the southern tip to the bottom right. Um, okay, well, it's also typical, eh? um, uh, it, it, the Netherlands are very organized in any area, so including the, uh, the area for, for agriculture, and uh, you see windmills, and uh, okay, what we're going to discuss, uh, first a few facts, just random facts from the Netherlands, uh, some characteristics about the Dutch people, uh, what is top of mind in the Netherlands uh, at the moment. Then uh, Tineke will, um, will discuss uh, some, well, immigration uh, in general, refugees, how we handle that in the Netherlands. And uh, as you know, the Netherlands are part of the European Union. So we are very much um, tied into the European Union and its policies. Well, not in all areas, uh, obviously. And then uh, sustainability. Uh, will uh, will be the last uh, topic that we will uh, address. Okay, Tineke. Yeah, um, well, on top you see uh, our royal family. We are a parliamentary uh, democracy and constitutional monarchy. To the left you see King William Alexander, uh, or King William IV, and his daughter. Um, this is Amalia. Uh, Amalia Caterina and uh, the wife Maxima from Argentina, Alexia, and the youngest one is called Ariane. 
Um, and at the bottom, the left picture is a picture of the second chamber, so the lower house, uh, the Dutch parliament, and to your right, you see the first chamber, uh, the upper house. So it's, it's the Senate, and the, to the left, you see the Congress. Yeah. And what's, uh, if I may, Tineke, what's interesting oh, yeah. to know is that uh, the Dutch constitution is not the, as old as the American one, because that was 1789 or so. Not sure, uh, but at, in uh, that um, uh, at that time there were uh, revolutions all over Europe, and uh, the monarch in the Netherlands was very afraid of those revolutions. So then he uh, asked a famous politician, uh, Torbeke, uh, to write uh, a constitution for the Netherlands, and that's still more or less the constitution. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that meant uh, the king didn't have as much power anymore as he used to have because he was afraid that, that his head would be chopped off as well. Um, so, and then the political parties uh, came into being and uh, you could vote. So uh, that's a very important year for us. And the minister was called Thorbecker and he's still uh, known and he's in many history books. So each uh, Dutch child should, should know of the Dutch constitution made by uh, Thorbecker. Yeah. And King William is uh, really into water management. He is, um, yeah, it's a pilot, but um, we, are, we have, of course, a very uh, sophisticated uh, water system, dike system, sluices, and uh, we are um, yeah, having a very tremendously amount of uh, knowledge about, um, about dikes and um, about water management. And we have to, because we are almost everywhere surrounded by water. Yeah, there will be a slide uh, later on. Yeah. Uh, keep on talking uh, to the microphone, uh, Tineke, because uh, I'm sorry. I, sometimes yeah. I uh, lose you a little bit. Okay. Okay. So population currently 17 and a half million, of uh, whom 24% with a migration background. Uh, well, Dutch people are the tallest in the world, allegedly, because um, some African uh, tribes uh, uh, seem to be even taller than uh, than we are. And um, well, I'll uh, I'll keep on sitting uh, because uh, I'm no way six feet, so it doesn't apply to me, nor uh, does it to uh, Tineke. But uh, apparently it is. Uh, by the way, this is our prime minister, uh, Mr. Rutte. That's R U W T E, uh, liberal from the Liberal Party, and he's all he's uh, prime minister already for ten years, and well, I think generally. Um, in the Netherlands, everybody thinks he does a very good job, and he's one of the longest um, uh, sitting prime ministers or um, leaders uh, of the European Union, and this is why he's quite influential uh, these days. So together with Merkel from Germany, Macron, France, uh, Rutte is really considered uh, to be uh, rather influential. Uh, okay, as Tineke said, um, this is how, you know, if our dike system uh, would break up, or would break, then uh, this is what uh, the Netherlands would look. So about 18% below sea level. And, uh, well, we are very safe here, because if the Mols in the south, uh, we will keep dry feet. But as you can see, Amsterdam is completely underwater. And, uh, well, as I said, 18%. Okay. A um, little bit about uh, the economy of the Netherlands. Uh, we're rated as the 17th uh, economy in the world. So GDP is uh, 189 billion, uh, which translates into 53,000 per capita. And we are the seventh exporting nation. And, well, believe it or not, but on, uh, uh, as far as agriculture is concerned, we are the second exporter after the US for a country of 17 and a half million. I think it's an indication, um, well, firstly, of the um, high technical level, because uh, we are growing uh, vegetables in greenhouses. It's all very sophisticated, uh, industrialized. So, um, and it's getting better and better. Uh, well, it's <laughs> high level, but there was this old joke that uh, uh, Dutch tomatoes were more or less, well, uh, for completely water. So, uh, especially in Germany, uh, uh, they mock this, but uh, apparently now uh, they are really of high quality as well. So, for the rest, it's a very open uh, liberal economy. Uh, and as you see, you know, we'll, later on we'll uh, talk a little bit about history. Uh, 
but then you will understand why uh, it's such an open economy. And um, as a matter of fact, um, it is said that uh, the first multinational company uh, was in fact uh, a Dutch one. That was the, um, the VOC, which would translate into the East India Company, uh, because Indonesia was one of the most profitable uh, colonies of the Netherlands. Uh, we've been there for, uh, for, for uh, a few centuries. And um, yeah, that was, that was really set up as a, uh, as a multinational. So, and for such a small country, all the names you see there, they're all Dutch companies or Dutch Anglo. Uh, Shell is uh, Dutch and uh, British. Uh, Unilever, the same thing. Uh, the other one, uh, well, Heineken is pretty uh, well known, obviously, uh, and all the others, Philips. Uh, ASML is an important one because they make uh, microchips and they do it very well. And they make uh, machines uh, that can make really the tiniest microchips. And now there's a dispute between the US and the Netherlands because uh, the US doesn't want ASML to export these machines uh, to China. Uh, just to give you an hunch of what, what is cooking here uh, on the, in that area. Okay, Tineke, yeah. back to you. Well, as you can see here, uh, well, about the Pardon, Tineke. Oh, yeah. Uh, in 2017, for the first time, a uh, majority of Dutch people uh, population indicated not to belong to any re religious uh, group. So, yeah, I think it's very Dutch also to, uh, to really dare to say that you uh, do not belong to any church at all. And it's, um, it's quite common, and church going has been uh, dropping down uh, since uh, many years. So maybe you could move forward. We've got plenty yeah. more to tell. Okay, the Netherlands is one of the founding members of the European Union, uh, which was originally started in uh, around the 1950s. Uh, there was pretty much an organization to control um, coal, uh, and gas, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And then later on it evolved and uh, became the European Union uh, as it is now. And as you can see on the map, uh, the United Kingdom is already grayed out. So as you all know, Brexit, um, which is by the way, uh, well, I, I love to follow the, the discussions in the British newspapers, but on the mainland Europe, well, it's less and less a topic. You know, for in general, it said, okay, we, the Brits are out. And uh, now there's a lot of hassle about a trade, uh, a trade deal. But uh, basically, it's uh, done and dusted. So um, we'll have to see how that pans out. But uh, they're, um, well, heading for a big storm, uh, is my personal opinion. But we'll see. Um, there you see to the bottom right, you see uh, Turkey. And uh, for a long time, but it's already 10 years ago or so, it was uh, said that Turkey was going to become a member of the European Union. And as you perhaps can imagine, uh, that, was, that caused a lot of controversy because uh, it's, a, it's, it's a big country and, well, almost completely Muslim. So you can imagine that, uh, you know, that was, was quite a discussion. And in the end, it was basically called off because uh, Turkey, uh, in the end, could not meet the requirements for, uh, for uh, being a member of the European Union. And there in the middle, you see Switzerland, a little country. All those countries have some, uh, of course, trade relations with the European Union, but they, uh, don't, uh, they're, they're not all members. And uh, uh, some of them use the Euro, some of them, most of them use the Euro, but some countries don't. Um, all right, a little bit of history. Well, as I said uh, before, um, the, the Portuguese, one, well, before the Europeans, the Chinese already roamed the, the oceans. Eh? Uh, but uh, okay, so from a European standpoint, uh, the Portuguese, the Spanish, uh, but the Dutch were already uh, pretty soon with, uh, you know, just getting on their wooden ship and uh, you know, sailing all, all across the ocean. And the red areas are basically the colonies um, that uh, the Netherlands had. Uh, well, one of one of them will uh, will look familiar uh, because uh, top left that's uh, New Amsterdam. So the Dutch were there before the English, and they in the end they decided to uh, trade it off to Suriname. 
which is in uh, South America, uh, top right. And uh, yeah, it said that the main reason was uh, Suriname is uh, much uh, richer in, uh, in uh, raw materials, dark sheet, for instance, and uh, many more. So there, Brazil, uh, you see a little uh, few Caribbean islands, and some of them are still part of the, uh, of the, of the Dutch kingdom. And then Africa, South Africa, uh, you know, something we're not proud of is uh, the word apartheid, which is basically a Dutch word. And to the right, Indonesia, but we've been in India as well. And apparently the Dutch made a big mistake at one time uh, because they were more powerful than the British at that time. And the British tried to um, uh, beat the Dutch at sea, uh, but they never could. Uh, and the main difference was that the Dutch already had a uh, financial system, uh, whereas the other uh, European nations, they were dependent on the money that the king would have. So uh, if the Dutch uh, lost a, a battle, then in a couple of months' time, there was a new fleet, because it was all private money. And uh, if the English king didn't have any money, then there was no fleet. And then the Brits were very uh, smart, because they imported... Uh, financial experts from uh, the Netherlands, got them to London, and they copied the financial system. And uh, then, oh, it's one of the factors, obviously, there were more, uh, but then basically the, the, the increase in the power for the British uh, started. And uh, one other, uh, the mistake of the Dutch was that uh, they said to the Brits, okay, you can have India. Uh, because uh, Indonesia was all about spices. And uh, India was more at that time about uh, cloth. And uh, it turned out that the market for spices went down tremendously and cloth, uh, uh, you know, increased. So that was one of those interesting facts, I think. So uh, the Netherlands have been uh, conquered and ruled by the Roman Empire long, long, long time ago. Uh, Spain, uh, that was actually our independence war. Independence, sorry for the typo. And uh, that was the William of Orange that Tineke spoke about earlier. Uh, he was our hero and he led the, the revolution or the war against the Spaniards. And so in 1648, uh, we, uh, we got rid of the Spaniards. Uh, and then later on, Napoleon uh, came by and uh, well, we had a big empire as well. And uh, well, we thank many things to Napoleon. There's a surnames, that was his idea. So he wanted to organize things better and to be able to identify people. So that's just one of the things. Many, many, many um, laws were introduced at that time. And uh, obviously, Second World War, uh, the First World War, uh, the Netherlands uh, managed to stay neutral. Um, we took in a lot of Belgian uh, uh, refugees, by the way. And uh, the idea was to stay neutral in the Second World War as well. But as you all know, uh, that didn't work out. So, uh, yeah, if you look at the location, seafaring, merchant, trade, and uh, a colonial power. Uh, okay, some characteristics. Your turn, Tideke. Yeah. Yeah, the movie. You should start the movie. Yeah, so this is the question, because this is yeah. often uh, said of the Dutch, that they're quite direct. Quite direct. Okay, so we have a little video, so hope uh, the sound and uh, works fine. Oh, I don't hear the sound. Maybe you should switch on um, Sorry. sound. Uh, yeah. for uh, okay, that's my mistake, because in Zoom you have to indicate uh, that you want to share your computer uh, sound, and I forgot about that. So give me a moment, uh -huh. if I can uh, do that directly. So uh, give me a second, I'll stop sharing for a moment. Uh -huh. Yeah, screen. Can you hear it? Yeah. yeah. When Dutch people are direct, 
towards me. In the beginning, it was a shock. Dutch people are quite direct to the point of uh, becoming rude in certain occasions. A lot of people told me that the Dutch are very rude. I think it's, the directness can be interpreted as rudeness by some people, especially if you're not used to it. Sometimes it can like come off as rude, but I think you just have to get used to the directness that they have here because that's just the culture. I'm not used to it, so it's strange. I find them direct, I don't find them rude, I just accept that that's the way they speak. It's not rude, they could be nicer. Yeah. I don't think they mean to be rude, but they're very direct, yeah. I don't know if it's me personally or my culture, but I'm very sensitive. What is considered rude, it depends on which country or culture you are in. Being direct in Chinese culture is quite a rule. In Australia, it's considered very rude if you speak your mind and it's not liked by the party you are speaking to. The Belgians don't really say what they want to say. The culture that where I came from, we use a lot of words to be able to cover if you want to say something, which is something also I don't like. It may sound a bit harsh because we generally, we soften it. I mean, it's nicer to soften it. If I was at a party in Canada and someone had spinach in their teeth, no one would say anything to that person and they would find out when they go home. Here in the Netherlands, someone would blurt out in front of everyone, you have some spinach in your teeth. I would say it's true that they're more direct than most cultures. Coming over here, when I ever talk to a, a Dutch person, they always tell you exactly what they're thinking. There are things that they say straight to the point. At the beginning, I was really shocked about the way that you say it really bum bum bum. I want to make an internship here, and I applied for many, many schools here. One of the answers that I got, we don't have time for your stage, apply another where else. <laughs> Thank you, wish you good luck. And I was like, what? <laughs> what is this? And it was a manager of school. He was like, I work in design and I need to do cool stuff, pretty stuff. My boss or my colleague is gonna come and say, This is so uninspiring. <laughs> He's right. Even myself, I know this is not my best work. We had a very funny neighbor, and he was very direct with us about the noise from our dogs or from, you know, if we flush the toilet in the middle of the night. But but that's good. Then I know what how to act around him as his neighbor when instead of him just being either pretending to be polite and pleased or um, being gruff with us and us not knowing why. Just there are times that I've had a few disagreements with with my partner and then I'll say that was uncalled for and he'll say no come on I'm Dutch that, and I'll say no you're not allowed to use say that phrase I'm Dutch there's being rude or hurting someone's feelings and there's being Dutch they are two different things don't mix them it can go overboard when you don't consider the person you're talking to and then you can either hurt your, their feelings or break a working relation being direct have pros and cons the process you don't need to find what is underneath so you easily get to know what he wants to say so that is really good but in some instances if you're given an assignment if you give it everything correct out of 100 98 of them are correct the Dutch can say yeah these two are wrong get it done so that's the something maybe Dutch also need to learn since you're working internationally a lot in the work environment if you are direct you go straight to the point it makes things so much easier. That's yeah. actually very true. Like that. Here, when I was working with my Dutch colleagues, it was perfect. Like, he made three, three lines, straight to the point, done. Well, for me, it was like a sort of relaxing. That at least someone said what he wants. That's, that's refreshing from my point of view. I appreciate that because it doesn't leave me confused about what they really think or feel. The objective is not for you to feel bad about it. So. They do it so you can actually know what didn't go properly and what you can change. And I think that comes from just being um, historically a very analytical people. They have a great mind because they always, you know, not encourage themselves, I think it also encourages all the people dare to think and dare to uh, uh, do something. What I really like about the Dutch is that they're very direct mm. and they're very blunt. Mm. But they are also very friendly. I think that they are direct, or very direct, but in in a good sense. Yes, it's uh, it's very nice. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we do speak our minds, and um, well, as you heard, uh, it's also appreciated that we are direct, and you, you might call it rude, but um, as long as we're also being uh, very nice, and we are. Um, um, experience as being nice, I think it's okay. Um, what you also see is uh, we don't have any hierarchy. 
you can call your, call your boss by his um, Christian name and um, there are also families where parents, um, where children call their parents by their uh, Christian name. Well, that's and, in most uh, of the cases, isn't it, Tineke, in the Netherlands? Well, we say, my, yeah, they say mom and dad, but they could also call you by your Christian name. But yeah. they, they still use mom and dad. I yeah, hear yeah, it all yeah, the time true, true. from yeah. our students. And yeah, so it's not mm -hmm. like all children call their parents by their Christian name. But they say you in the, you, you always have you in uh, how you speak to uh, other persons, but we have another form, which which uh, ooh, which shows more respect. Yeah, and, uh, most form. children oh. say you, which isn't the ooh form, which would be more respectful. But they respect their parents, whether they call them by the first name or call them mom or dad. Okay. Yeah, yeah maybe that, uh, the little finger. We always know best. Yeah, that's. Um... Yeah, it's a Dutch yeah, word, right. obviously, fingertje, uh, and that points to, you know, that Dutch have the reputation, okay, uh, very straightforward, direct, as we have seen, and uh, okay, so you always uh, seem to know best, and sometimes also pretty loud, so those are the, the lesser qualities uh, of the Dutch, I would say, at least many people uh, would think so. Okay, uh, as some... Some of you, all of you may know, Dutch society is considered to be very liberal. Uh, well, there, marijuana, uh, that was, uh, well, these days, I understand that some American states are, have surpassed uh, the Dutch, basically, uh, in uh, being liberal towards uh, drugs. And in the Netherlands, we've always made a uh, distinct, we've distinguished between hard drugs, heroin, cocaine, stuff like that, and soft drugs. That's marijuana and hashish, and that has, you know, uh, for as long as I live, always to be considered, uh, well, that's more like, uh, you know, like having a drink or so. And um, then... Oh, uh, I think you're stuck a bit, Gilles. Okay, we don't hear Gilles anymore. Um, well, maybe I it? could speak and... Um, do you hear me? Um, yeah, we have no, I do a little first, bit. Um, okay. Mm, sorry about that. Internet connection. Let me see if I can. Is there any sound? Okay. Uh, Tirke, can you hear me or not? I think Tineke might have dropped oh. off the call. Yeah. Your sound is okay, Gilles. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. No okay. problem at all. Uh, otherwise, we can just continue. Tineke. Okay, sorry. Uh, so, uh, the picture uh, bottom left. Uh, the Netherlands were, in fact, the first country to allow gay marriage. Um, well, um, top right uh, picture. Uh, that's quite controversial. It's about euthanasia. I think they're having some internet trouble, which uh, we are having too. Renee, if you want to go on for a little while. I, I can. I can try. I didn't prepare this uh, um, presentation, but I can try. I think he, was start, uh, he started to talk about euthanasia, and that's uh, something well, not, not everyone agrees on in the Netherlands. So we also have discussions about it, but it's, you know, it's, um, it's a human right for, in our country. Oh, now the presentation is gone. <laughs> um, and I saw something from the, well, some of you probably recognize it's the red light uh, district in Amsterdam. But actually a touristical trap, you know, it's not really, it's, you know, all tourists go there, but all the Dutch people, they just think it's just a tourist thing. And um, well, we all have our own opinions about um, exploiting women in this way. Um, so I don't think it's really, really typical Dutch. Um, and then about the being rude thing, 
Um, I think it's also because we highly value being direct. So it's more of respect to the, towards the other person to be direct um, and to talk about the truth, to give a, 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 a oh, there he is again. <laughs> Welcome back, Helis. Yeah, sorry about this. We don't know what happened, but uh, thanks, Rene, for uh, filling in. Yeah. And yeah, I, I just jumped in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah. Well, what I was going to say, but maybe you did already, Rene, that there's a lot of misunderstanding about the euthanasia. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. articles appear in the uh, foreign press that, uh, you know, we get rid of our elderly people like that, and uh, it's not at all the case. There's uh, many laws around this. There's two, three doctors. I think it's based on this liberal thought of that you, it's your life, you own it. And, uh, you know, so you uh, should have the final say. Also, you know, if it's not worth living anymore, in your opinion, then there should be possibilities. That's, I think, that's what, uh, what is the case. Uh, yep. Okay. Yeah. And you addressed uh, the sex industry already a bit, uh, Renee? I did. Yeah. I yeah. just did, the, yes, very yeah. short. Yeah. And in general, uh, because Amsterdam is famous for it, and the new mayor, uh, who's a woman, uh, Femke Alsema, uh, she's really trying to get rid of this because basically, apart from the foreigners, but it's really a circus there. And, uh, you know, people crowded and looking at the girls there, uh, basically most people hate it. And, uh, you know, General Dutch uh, wouldn't go there. Uh, but it's very difficult because all these houses are owned, uh, privately owned, and it's very difficult uh, to get rid of them. So, uh, but uh, she continues trying. And now the latest plan is to move that business outside of the city. And um, so I think it's a good idea, but we'll see how that uh, develops. And maybe I can add something. It also attracts the wrong kind of tourists, tourists because they exactly. want to change the, um, the group of tourists visiting Amsterdam. They, they would like to, to have more the, the, the people who are interested in, in, for example, Van Gogh Museum or uh, more cultural tourists instead of the, the tourists who are coming over for the red light district and the drug, uh, the coffee yeah. shops. Yeah, so that's absolutely. why they also want to get rid of them. Yeah, and what is interesting is that uh, the policy now is to try to um, have the tourists go explore more than only Amsterdam. So now the, eh, um, uh, they, they uh, apply their marketing, so they call places uh, Zandvoort, which is on, I think, 20 kilometers away from Amsterdam, which is, to American standards, is basically nothing, right? Uh, so now they started calling that Amsterdam Beach. And for foreigners, certainly Americans, well, that's fine. A train ride of 10 minutes or uh, 15 minutes. Uh, so in this way, they will try to have the tourists explore more of the country. And there's absolutely more to see than uh, Amsterdam only. Okay, let's see. Okay. Same, we already, oh, same-sex marriage. No, no, I already said we were, the Netherlands was the first country yeah, to allow this. Yeah. Okay, so those same experts from the video that I just showed you, anymore, in general, I think we Dutch can, uh, can confirm that this is what we hear often. Eh? A well-organized country, uh, you know, so well-organized that every little thing, there's a law or an arrangement, uh, sometimes it drives you crazy. By English level, in general, most Dutch people, uh, you know, have a certain level in English. And uh, fairly easygoing as well. Uh, not so great, the weather, which is personal, of course, I, uh, I don't mind. And also what experts sometimes comment upon is uh, that if you don't speak Dutch, then uh, it's pretty hard to integrate uh, with Dutch people. Um, well, that's their uh, experience anyway. And service culture, well, I guess it depends on uh, what part of the country you are, but uh, I've lived in Amsterdam myself, and indeed, you wouldn't believe it. You know, you enter a shop and then they look at you. Well, firstly, that you may thank God that you enter their beautiful shop and then you expect service as well. You know, like that, it's usually crazy. But okay, there's, uh, there's local differences, absolutely. Uh, top of mind, uh, what is in the news? Um, okay, Tinker. Oh, yeah. um, it was last week, Thursday, uh, Princess Dove at school. And uh, on this day, the king and the queen uh, read the 
the, um, the State of the Union, and um, it uh, uh, it's about the plans, the financial plans of um, of the cabinet in 2021. And um, well, the the Queen I know made a fuss of it that she wore the same dress. Um, yeah, it's a typical female thing, sorry. But as uh, she did a couple of years ago, she just dyed it a bit a little bit um, darker yellow, as if to show um, we don't want to spend money um, um, just um, yeah, getting a new dress. And um, so they, they made a statement. She made a statement uh, with that. Uh, we have a deficit of uh, 30, uh, 43 billion uh, euros. Um, and it's um, uh, mostly due to um, COVID-19 because uh, every um, um, every businessman, I, I think they got 6,000 euros um, support, yeah, support packages um, for um, entrepreneurs. And um, yeah, they don't talk about uh, the deficit right now. They want to stimulate uh, the economy and um, well, make it, um, they don't want to cut on, uh, on, on finances right now. They want to make a statement. And I think, uh, wasn't it about pains that you were talking? Yeah. Um, uh Normally, the, the Dutch would, uh, in, in uh, times of um, financial uh, problems, uh, the Dutch government would automatically um, uh, have, uh, apply austerity, uh, uh, economize. And this is actually the, the first time uh, that they decided otherwise. And now they follow uh, Keynes, so to stimulate the economy, invest, uh, they, they um, made uh, 20 billion available for innovative ideas, and uh, it's quite a yeah, it's quite a change in in policy. So that was last week, and it's called Inches Dag, Day of the Little Princess, uh, as also in history. But uh, anyway, so uh, the, um, the State of the Union, and it contains the budget for the next year and uh, a summary of the same budget. Okay, COVID nineteen. Um, the Netherlands applied a so-called intelligent lockdown, meaning no complete lockdown, so really seeing where that, uh, for instance, uh, currently or since a month or two, face masks are mandatory in public transportation, but that's it. The middle high schools are open with, of course, the, the certain measurements in place uh, and vocational education where we work, uh, very limited. The students come to school uh, one day per week and uh, they should respect the distance of one and a half meter and certainly to the teachers. And uh, lately, since a week or so, or two weeks, uh, the numbers are rising again. So it's, um, yeah, we will have to see how it develops, but it doesn't look good. Uh, and well, that was interesting. Yesterday or only two days ago, there was this big scandal because uh, of course we also have influencers, basically very young people uh, who are uh, very good at uh, at doing makeup or sing a song or whatever. And uh, well, they have 100 or 200,000 followers. And then there was one girl, uh, Femke Louise, yeah, uh, 24 or so, 100 or 200,000 followers, I don't know. She was paid by the government a couple of months ago to promote the idea for youngsters, uh, young people to keep the distance, to respect the measurements. And okay, she did. But now, together with a few other YouTubers, I don't know them, uh, all of a sudden um, they had enough of it and uh, now they stated, okay, uh, we won't uh, respect it anymore, it's rubbish. Well, it's really crazy. And then yesterday she was at uh, really a national talk show and uh, it was quite brave of her to show up there. But there she was really with the experts you know, from the government and then uh, she had to uh, lower her tone <laughs> big time. And uh, well, one important, uh, one interesting fact is that the mink breeding, if that's a correct translation, it's industry in our province where it was quite big. Um, well, it turned out that, uh, you know, Corona spread uh, very easily among the, 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 in this industry. And now they decided to completely uh, stop it. So mink industry is uh, history in, uh, in the Netherlands. This is around Corona. Okay, other things, uh, parliamentary elections in March. And uh, well, and uh, many sport events uh, have been canceled, obviously. Dutch love football, mostly, more than that, but football is the biggest one. 
and uh, the European Championship uh, was supposed to be this year, uh, but of course was cancelled. And then uh, the Olympics, as you know, so uh, there was really an increased attention for the Tour de France, the cycling uh, uh, sport. Uh, and the Dutch are very proud of Max Verstappen because finally we have a you know a top race driver. So uh, well, not for everyone, but uh, and then that's another one, Enco Chat. That was quite interesting because uh, I think a month ago or so, it turned out that Dutch police uh, had been able to hack into EncroChat is a company that provides uh, encrypted uh, telephones that are used by all criminals uh, to exchange messages and uh, prepare stuff, as you can imagine. And then the Dutch uh, police uh, have been able to hack into that system. So they were able for months to listen to all the conversation that were going on, to follow the chats and stuff like that. So since then, uh, hundreds of uh, meth labs have been uh, uh, found, uh, hundreds uh, arrests made, assassinations uh, avoided, stuff like that. It's really never seen that. And uh, they have 20 million calls. And they only have uh, research like, uh, you know, one quarter of it or not half. So there's still many more things to come. So this was quite uh, big news uh, recently. Okay, innovation. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've got some slides with statistics, and I think um, um, I don't want to deal with them all because otherwise uh, we have the sustainability uh, to deal with as well, which is very interesting. Um, well, the Netherlands have been a country uh, with many um, other cultures, um, um, as you can see here. Um, well, the reasons for immigration are a work, study, a family re reunion, and asylum. Uh, Seekers, uh, uh, of course, we all know about that. Um, well, this is a bit, bit. Um, the letter is a bit tiny, but um, the Netherlands has uh, 17.4 million inhabitants, and four million of those are uh, Western and non-Western immigrants. So we have a total of 24% of um, immigrants in the Netherlands, uh, four million. Um, well, they come, people come here to work, to study, ex escaping war zones and asking asylum, to marry and to be reun reunited with their families. Um, let me see. Yeah, we will, um, I will talk about this in a minute, but um, um, you might have to uh, want to know that after the Second World War, um, uh, the Netherlands scouted um, uh, people from Morocco, Spain, Turkey and Italy actively to work in factories where uh, we didn't have enough people to uh, to work, so um, we had an active uh, policy of getting those people uh, uh, to the Netherlands. Um, at the end of the 40s, after the Second World War, um, Indonesia became independent, and thousands of Indonesian families um, um, they were uh, Dutch and uh, mixed uh, families they uh, came to the Netherlands. And in the years after that, we had a lot of immigrants uh, coming to the Netherlands, like uh, Cape Verdean sailors who wanted to um, um, who wanted to work in Rotterdam, uh, the harbor, because of the good working conditions. And um, well, after that, in the 80s, we had the boat refugees. Uh, in 1975, Suriname became independent. Uh, Suriname came to uh, study uh, and came to the Netherlands. Uh, people, students from the Dutch Antilles came to the Netherlands and after their study they mostly uh, stayed here. In the 90s, as we all know, uh, 1995, uh, uh, the former Yugoslavia fell apart and many people, especially the Bosnians, came to the Netherlands. And we in school, we could also see uh, students from uh, Bosnia and later from Somalia, all refugees, all wars that you knew, um, um, well, um, we, we had the students uh, and, and we could see that they, um, they came from these areas, of course. Um, um, what we also see is um, at, in 2000, 2007, uh, a lot of Polish workers came here and that's what you see in the, in the chart. Uh, the top four of um, immigration um, uh, countries, or we, we should stop, was from Poland, India, Romania and Syria. But I, I can have a look at the ten minutes. Yeah. We only have 10 minutes left and we've got so yeah. much 
yeah. so much so, to tell. Janet, uh, yeah. you being uh, the moderator, uh, what do you propose? Uh, leave 10 minutes for a Q&A or get a few slides more? We wanted yeah. to address uh, sustainability, sustainability a little bit. Yeah. Um, can, you do, can you address sustainability in about two minutes? Uh, yeah, I will. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry about sorry. that, uh, Tina. Yeah. It's a critics, uh, critics that I get from my students often that I uh, yeah. talk way too much. Yeah, you can really, really <laughs> Okay, sustainability. So energy sources in the Netherlands, uh, nuclear, we have one nuclear plant. And, and well, the, it's back on the agenda now, uh, I must say. And then uh, renewable is only 7%. We're at the bottom of the list in the European Union. Hmm. There, the Dutch um, mentality is there. It was partly on purpose because the Dutch government decided to postpone all the investments because they were too expensive. And now Germany is already on uh, 13, 15%. And now the Dutch are going to start because everything got a lot cheaper. The investments in solar, you know, so it's rather Dutch do it like that. Okay, so natural gas. Uh, we've, you know, uh, the economy is based on natural gas for the last decades, but, and that's uh, um, in uh, the north of the country. But now they took so much gas out that there's many earthquakes there. So people's houses are, you know, uh, being destroyed. So now they're halting. So uh, in a couple of years time, no gas anymore. Uh, okay, we have a climate agreement, CO2 emission down by 49% in 2030, 95 even 2050. Lowest renewables in the EU. Uh, yeah, solar energy, wind energy, uh, biomass, biomass is completely abandoned. Uh, because, you know, when you use waste wood, that's fine. But turned out that we had shipped from North Carolina, you know, wood from new trees. So, you know, it was completely destroyed. And that's not the idea, obviously. So uh, they're going to completely halt that the biomass. Okay. Um, yeah, PVEs, electrical vehicles. We, uh, we go very fast in that area. Uh, ecological footprint with our current uh, energy consumption is one extra earth we would need. And for your information, US would need three more Earth. Um, okay, then last in uh, December 2019, our school, Koning Willem I College, was proclaimed, proclaimed most sustainable college for vocational education and training in the Netherlands. So the last slide is uh, a short uh, video about our school in particular and what we do in the area of sustainability. Can you hear it? No? Hold on. No. Sorry. Okay. Share screen. Okay. There we go again. This is the land of the King William I College, where 1,300 people work for more than 13,000 students. It's almost like a real village. There is, for instance, a clothing design shop, a dental practice, a pharmacy, a metal factory. There is a department for electronics and for robotics. There is a garage, a construction hall, our own catering, and much, much more. In this land, we're also working with global goals. These are 17 goals of the United Nations to help each other and the world. For instance, we help garages in Ghana. We collect money for charities. And we renovate schools in Bosnia. Also, we have a theatre training programme. Give performances for example, for the week of respect. And we pay attention to different cultures. What is very special is that we write letters to people who are unjustly in prison. We help children to make their dreams come true. Our pleasant school wants us to use less and less energy. That's why we are insulating all windows. 
We have an energy roof that produces hot water to heat the buildings in the morning. We installed 900 solar panels with which we generate a lot of electricity. We are constructing a new building with much wood and many sustainable materials. We also consider the environment when purchasing tables, chairs and carpets. We have a beautiful and energy efficient ventilation system. We already have electric cars and poles where you can charge them and our electric bicycles on solar energy. The stewards drive electric carts. We have 30 bicycles in school so that classes can go on excursions by bike. And of course, we use public transport as much as possible. We aim for healthy and sustainable catering. With a wide choice of healthy products. Our hospitality department therefore uses only seasonal products from the region and organically. This means without fertilizers and pesticides. We have water taps, good honest coffee in cardboard cups with wooden steers and cardboard straws. And we pay attention to litter and waste. We let our students design creative waste bins, e.g. one with glowing tiles or one that can shred plastic or one that looks like a tree. The school separates waste as much as possible. We even keep leaf waste separate. We do not use pesticides. We burn weeds. We reuse valuable materials for crafting. The assignments about sustainability come from society. We think with our students about food waste. We ensure that ICT students can install and program our solar heaters. We make posters of beautiful statements. We give nature a helping hand. We teach global goals in our school. That's why we are a UNESCO school. And we want to help the United Nations to create a better world. We are now the most sustainable Sorry about that. Something went wrong. It was the last slide. Um, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So friends, um, some of you are already sending me messages saying you have three o'clock meetings and you're dropping off. So anybody who needs to go, you are welcome. Thanks for coming. Our next meeting will be on week from today, next Tuesday, uh, excuse me, next Wednesday at two o'clock. It'll be JCCC travelers to the Middle East. And for those, so we hope you will join us again. But for those of you who can stay, um, we have some questions here that uh, it would be great if we could have them answered. Is and there still so time, if, uh, Janet? If you are willing to stay on, we can stay on Absolutely. a few more minutes. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, let me start then with um, a question about all the about Black Lives Matters protests. Um, can you tell us? Um, what way they've been influencing uh, current discussions and what your impressions are? Are the protests positive or negatively affecting the culture? Well, it's a hot topic and uh, started off in the United States, obviously, with uh, Floyd. And uh, it has changed um, aspects. Uh, well, um, Tineke, René, if you, uh, tell me if you don't agree, but in, in some ways. Uh, in very good ways, because we are many people who always said, yeah, listen, it's not an issue. I'm not a racist, but now it's more urgent to, uh, you know, to support it. That, uh, so not stay neutral, but really express yourself that you think this is important. And uh, personally, I think in the Netherlands, pure racism, well, you know, really, I feel better because you're black. Well, that's hard, hardly the case. Would you agree or not? Yeah. No, that's for sure. No, I, the only thing I was stating that really pure racism, as in you are black, I am white, so I am better, that I've seldomly uh, encountered in the. 
Tineke, je bent niet te verstaan. You, you're very hard to, to understand, Tineke. Okay. Well, Tineke was uh, saying about, you know, it's often hidden. And me as a white man and Tineke as a white woman, it's difficult for us to, uh, of course, to feel what, uh, and then we're talking not only black people, but, um, you know, Moroccans, Turks in, the, in uh, Holland. But, uh, uh, and of course, I do agree, I do appreciate that. But I still maintain um, that, you know, pure racism, uh, I've never encountered it. But it's, uh, of course, we should be conscious that it's really uh, about equality. And absolutely, uh, to give you an example, our students, uh, when they apply for a traineeship and uh, he signs with Mohammed, yeah, absolutely that he has, you know, less chance of getting a good traineeship. So that much is true. So uh, it, it's absolutely developing and uh, the discussion is there. And uh, we had this uh, natural holiday, uh, Sinterklaas, uh, a white man with a beard and he had assistants, all black. And uh, now, you know, under influence partly of this because it's been going on for a couple of years already, but now it's almost abolished. So there will be some, uh, some consequences and positive ones. Uh, I don't know, Rene, would you agree with what I'm saying? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I agree. But I was on the, at the same time writing something in the chat. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. No, but uh, I, I agree. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, in, indeed, uh, made, made a lot of, uh, you know, started the, up the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. But it's, uh, I think, in many ways, incomparable to US society, which is obvious, of course, there's, there's a very, very different history there. Um, okay. Janet? So another question is about um, the social safety net that you have for citizens during this time. Um, has it increased because of things like unemployment, food assistance? You mentioned that, um, you're, that the budget is running a big deficit. And he also wanted to know if there's national health care. There's absolutely national health care, a pretty good one, if I may say so. We pay roughly 140 euros. That would be $170 or so, I'm not really sure, or per month. month. And then you get your, and on top of that, you pay 380 euros, we call it, uh, well, it's a sort of a deposit. So when you go to the, uh, so you pay that 140 per month, uh, but then when you go to the dentist, for instance, or a special treatment, uh, they will charge you up to 380, but it depends on many of the uh, things are for free, but some you may uh, need to pay for, up to a maximum of 350 for um, a year. And after that, everything is for free. No, um, I paid that 150, I, a couple of a year ago, I had a big operation on my knee, a new uh, ligament, yeah, it didn't cost me anything, basically. So I would say we have a pretty good healthcare system and related to COVID, apart from the packages that the government issued, so billions of support for, uh, to, to, uh, to maintain the jobs, basically. So they paid 90% of the salary uh, of companies. Now, the third package is in place, and that's only up to 70%. So, yes, they go to great length. And, uh, well, and the Dutch, you know, because of they are, their financial health and economize, uh, we're looking pretty okay. You know, it shouldn't last for, for, uh, for, uh, for a decade. But, um, well, the, the Dutch are doing, Netherlands are doing okay as far as uh, that is concerned. And in general, I think the Dutch can say we have a, a pretty good uh, social welfare system still. No. So you don't have to worry about paying your health bills. What does worry the Dutch more than anything else today? Yeah. Yeah, COVID, yeah, and uh, worries about the future and if the government uh, doesn't cough up any longer the support. So, and now, you know, it's increasing again. So we are pretty, uh, yeah, what will be coming, you know? There will be many jobs lost, uh, definitely. And talks in government are also to aim at, um, uh, how do you call that, re-education. So for people just to change jobs and uh, to, to help them uh, doing other educations and uh, just switch uh, because there's many areas in the economy uh, that need really people. So it's also a driver 
for people to change their lives. Eh? There's a lot of misery, eh? don't get me wrong, sure. People who lost their job and insecurity and uh, food banks, we also have them. And uh, well, not used as widely, but um, well, certainly, yeah, there. So apart from COVID, Renee, Tineke? Yeah, I would like to... I would like to add something. I think also the upcoming elections in the United States is also uh, an interesting yeah. thing for us to follow and also something, well, well, depends on the person, of course, but also something to worry about a little bit. I just wrote in the, in the comments about the, the, the passing of Judge uh, Ginsburg and the, in, yeah. you know, the impact of this on the, the political situation and um, the way the, the, the different groups are stand you know, the, the um, choosing their points of view. And so that's, I think that's really a big thing for a lot of people to worry about. Yep. Yeah. Well, we're all worrying about it. So you're welcome to join us. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know in yeah. a way I'm feeling sorry for you. I know it sounds very strange, but you know, I'm really worried about your beautiful society, about your beautiful country, and especially about the, the way the two groups are standing, you know, the, the differences are becoming bigger and yeah. instead of joining, you know, how do you, I don't know how to explain it, but it worries me a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, the polarization eh? and yes. it's all over the Anglo-Saxon world because in the UK you see the same thing. It's so yes. really, yeah. there's no healthy discussion possible any longer. You know, it's either. And yeah, I'm sorry to say it's, that's what I hate the most about, um, the reason is completely gone. You know, these days, the truth doesn't matter any longer. You can just, if you yeah. control the media or whatever, you can lie your, through your teeth and people accept it. And they are willing to forgive. Yeah, but he did. Johnson, same thing. Sorry, I get a bit, uh, <laughs> but uh, that's what I follow. And I completely agree, Rene. That's uh, really top of mind because we are very much still, uh, although... I think, yeah, it's, it's language related, I would say. But we have beautiful, great countries all around us, you know, France, Germany. But, mm -hmm. you know, because of the language, English, it's still the, uh, the case that the United States and the Brits have the most cultural influence on the Dutch society. So, uh, you know, it's, it's very inf influential to, uh, to Europe and the Netherlands, definitely. And so, especially uh, also the polarization in, in combined with the... Um, uh, COVID, it's a, it's, a, it's a dangerous combination with strong leaders and, and alternative facts and, um, yeah. you know, doubting the, um, you know, the facts in general. I think that's, um, that's disturbing. Yeah. Yeah. And not, not only in the United States, but it happens the same in the UK and other countries yeah. all over the world. Yeah, we have many of those so, guys now in uh, Hungary, Orban. Yeah, because yeah. There, it's very difficult to you know, have a shared policy in the Euro European Union towards refugees, for instance, to Visegrad countries, basically Poland, uh, Czech Republic, Hungary. They just bluntly say, we won't take any refugee. And the European Union hasn't got the means to really uh, force them to. And, um, but on the other hand, don't forget, the European Union was a project, you know, working economically together. And now you see that it gets a lot of criticism, but people tend to forget, you know, it's a project uh, in, in um, how do you call it, in progress. Um, it, it needs to develop. They already got a long way, you know. There hasn't been any war. NATO has, uh, has uh, been a reason for that as well, but the EU definitely uh, mm -hmm. as well. And I think certainly after Brexit that most people are glad to be in the European Union because it seems to be the only reasonable place these days. You know, uh, even in Europe, we have uh, a few of these guys, but then also uh, we have Putin next door, uh, Duterte, well, you name them, you all know them. <laughs> so uh, I think that's, well, it's definitely top of my mind. <laughs> I yeah. Say, yeah. Well, Can I add something? Oh, Go sorry. ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to, to well, to maybe to, uh, as a conclusion, that's why international uh, internationalization is so Very important. Yeah. So we, because we have to work together and, um, it makes each other stronger if you if you listen to each other and um, instead of the polarization, but just to share our values and to find our common values. I think that's very important. And that's why these events are so important to to organize. Couldn't yeah. agree more.
Well, thank you, and we appreciate your concern and kind thoughts about our election. Another question said, um, the, the, the last video, I believe, did it talk about a week of respect? I think that might have been with um, yep. theater mm -hmm. students. And this question was, what does that consist of? And do the, the general population celebrate it or just your school? Um, yeah, we, I think maybe Renee most knows more about that. What we used to have a community week and, um, mm -hmm. and I think it was followed up by the week of respect and it's uh, national in schools and you can join or yeah. you can't join. And um, you, as a teacher, you can pay attention to that with your students and there's all kinds of programs, but I'm not sure, um, when, when did we have the last week of respect then? I mean, there's so many weeks and so many things, but um, we have the week of dialogue and, no. yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. there's many things we, we do. And I can't quite remember when no. we had the last week. Do you do, do you remember, Renee? No, not recently. No, it's once a year and it's a national week. So all, a lot of schools are paying yeah. attention on it and they have yeah. special projects during this week. But it's not recent. I think it's the end of the year. Mm. More, more during fall or winter time. Yeah. Yeah. I don't quite remember. Well, maybe we could have a week of respect. That sounds like a great yeah. idea. Yeah. Um, question is, are there significant regional political differences in the Netherlands, like north versus south, big city versus rural areas? Um, we mentioned polarization in the U.S. And the question yeah. is, is there anything yeah. similar? I can imagine, but uh, looking at the size of the Netherlands, this is much less apparent in, uh, in the Netherlands. You know, it's, it's tiny. It takes you two and a half hours to drive from one end to the other. So the differences, for instance, between rural areas and cities, it's not so big. And, but you could say that uh, the western part is, uh, of the Netherlands is considered to be one big city. And then you still only have 4 million people. So, uh, so no, the, the answer would be no. There's no big regional differences politically, uh, I would say. No. What about between um, sort of the native born, uh, very liberal Dutch people, traditional Dutch people, and you've got 24% immigrants, some from more conservative mm. societies. Is there a problem there? You yeah. want to alter or? Uh... Yeah, there's oh, me, a me? problem. I wouldn't call, people have problem with, um, with It's immigrants. difficult to understand, Tineke. Okay. No, people yeah, people who are friend. having problems with immigrants are not mo the most liberal types of people. They're mm. the right wing types of people, the conservatives. And they, and I think um, they are not happy having, uh, they, they don't have, uh, good jobs, their housing is a problem, could be a problem. Um, and they are kind of jealous of um, immigrants because they have the idea that they are sometimes getting houses sooner than, um, yeah. than their children. Yeah. And um, yeah, and that is, yeah, Ed Will might have known of this man and he's like um, yeah, the populist who feeds this, um, this, this feeling yeah. of those who are not happy with their lives. And everybody who has um, a good life, uh, good wealth, etc., they're not really, um, yeah, they, they are more open to other um, nationalities and other cultures than, yeah. than, than conservative. Um, yeah. yeah. We have a few right wing parties, yeah. but basically, uh, in, as far as that is concerned, the Netherlands are a very dull country because whatever parties are chosen, um, the end result is always in the middle and depending on which party won it's a little bit right of the middle and otherwise left of the middle and of course right wing uh, um, uh, people often use this uh, like Tineke explained uh, they take our jobs and do this and that and uh, oh, they don't speak our language but then then you ask them yeah but you live next door to Mohammed yeah, but Mohammed, that's my old mate. And, uh, you know, it's, it's often, it's not really well thought out. Yeah, so often it's, it's a general, but um, no, it's not a big, uh, there will, will be part of the population, but uh, I think that's, that's really small. Generally, uh, we know we, well, I hope we all know that we need immigrants. You know, the, the, the Dutch population is uh, 
would you say, uh, gray, graying, getting older. Eh? Uh, so we absolutely need new input, um, like, like uh, the US does, uh, I suppose. And um, so many people do realize that. This. So in my opinion, it's definitely not a big issue or so. Eh? There, it will be an issue here and there, and sometimes <laughs> depending on the economical situation, perhaps. But uh, it's, quite, yeah, it's quiet on that front, I would say. Well, that's good to hear. Um, the last question was one from early on that you had typed into the chat. You said it's a big topic, but maybe you could summarize it. We do hear about the goals of low carbon emissions and that the dairy farmers in particular are yeah. unhappy. Yeah, um, that's any comments? Absolutely, yeah. Well, uh, as I said before, we're the second agricultural uh, export uh, country. And basically, it's, it's silly that we have such a big industry uh, partly it's greenhouses, and, but also uh, traditional uh, out on the fields. And it's so well cultivated, you know, there's, there's more and more uh, fear about, you know, the natural environment. Uh, you, you hardly can see any meadows, you know, with wild flowers in it, or it's all one picture I showed, you know, all uh, very organized and, and cultivated. And it's way too big, that industry. And the carbon emission, uh, well, it's absolutely uh, certain that uh, the agriculture contributes uh, uh, greatly to this, uh, to this problem. Uh, but our farmers are really very activist. Um, agriculture all over the European Union has been supported financially, always. You know, there's a big chunk from the European budget that goes mm -hmm. to farmers still. And, you know, it's not necessary anymore, but they are quite vigilant. And, uh, you know, get, even can get violent, you know, they block the roads and they go to The Hague and um, so they have... Uh, the, 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 the Farmers Defence Force. Yeah, it's, got, it's a militant group of farmers yeah. <laughs> defending their rights as yeah. farmers at the yeah, moment. Yeah, and these days, as all of us realise, with social media, you know, it's much more easy to, you know, to stir up those, those feelings and... Uh, so it's been a big discussion, uh, and uh, it still is. But uh, you know, the government has stated clearly that emission has to go down uh, any way they can. So they are starting to buy up farmers, eh? so they get offers to sell their uh, farms. And you know, it's uh, it's in progress now. We'll have to see. But it's clear that uh, that uh, the chunk of, of uh, agriculture has to has to be diminished for that. Uh, uh, carbon emission uh, problem that we have big time as well. Yeah. Well, the whole globe, obviously. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking the extra time with us, for just telling us about the Netherlands. Um, it's obviously we have close ties or have had close ties, yeah, not absolutely. only country to country, but JCCC <laughs> to some of you. And we hope okay. to continue those ties. We're working to promote them and we really appreciate your time. Thank and for some of the much. rest of you, yes, we All do hope to see you. For listening, yeah. You're welcome. Good luck. Good luck Thank with you. everything with COVID. Thank and you very you. much. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you for having us. Bye -bye. And we will reconvene again next Wednesday.